I pray you bless our worship today. I pray you would, Lord, just uh, send your Holy Spirit and give us a blessing through thy word. I pray you cover us with your blood. Lord, forgive us for our sins. I pray that you cleanse us, cleanse us with your precious blood. And Lord, uh, just help our minds and spirits to be steadfast and that we would glean from thy word today. Bless the kids in Sunday school as well. Well, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, before the kids are dismissed, I just wanted to tell you real quickly, um, I got some Sunday school topics that the Lord's been giving to me. Uh, for you Sunday school teachers, I think this might come in handy. And I wanted to tell you too, Kathy has a bunch of folders over in the file cabinets with lesson plans that she's created for Sunday schools. Of the word abomination. And for those that weren't here last Sunday school, last week, I did a whole Sunday school on the word abomination. The kids can go ahead and be dismissed. And if we take a look at the word abomination, what does it mean? And what do we figure it meant last week? It means extreme hatred, to detest something. So when something is abominable to God, he hates it. He detests it. If something is abominable to us, we detest it. We hate it. If something is abominable to the world, to anybody, the word abomination means extreme hatred uh, to detest something. The object of detestation, okay? Uh, in short, whatever is an object of extreme hatred is called an abomination, okay? So with that in mind, the law of first mention, we mentioned this last week, the law of first mention, the Hebrews were an abomination to the Egyptians. And that was in Genesis, Genesis 43, verse 32. They were hated from the very start. So the word abomination, law of first mention, goes with people being hated by another group. And wouldn't that carry, that tune carry throughout history? You know, what group has been hated more than the Jews? I mean, from the beginning, they were hated. Um, and, and people hate them sometimes for no cause at all. Just absolutely no cause. There's something inside of the human heart that, uh, from the law of first mention, it's just that the Jews would be hated of other nations. and. That's that's the law of first mentioned in the Bible. The Egyptians hated them. They, they were an abomination to them. And the reason they were was because, what did I explain? They were shepherds, and the Egyptians worshipped animals. So the Jews dealt with the animals. In fact, they sacrificed the animals, which made them to be loathed in the sight of the Egyptians because they would actually sacrifice the gods of the Egyptians. Okay, and then I got into meat eating and being a vegetarian and i said you know it's not wrong to be a vegetarian a lot of people say well you're wrong for being a vegetarian no if you're doctor or if you have a weak stomach or you can't handle digesting meat uh, the bible does give you room to become a vegetarian and it says he that is weak eateth herbs herb that's a vegetarian they eat herbs so if you're weak and you have a weak system or you're weak and you can't handle the meat, then eat that. But it's becoming more than just that in the world. It's becoming a religion. And it's on menus, it's everywhere else. Hey, that would be fine too. But see what's happening here is these agendas are being pushed on other people. That's where the problem lies. You know, you have people out there saying, don't kill the animals. You know, don't hunt the deer, don't hunt the bear, don't don't kill the cow, don't kill the the goat, don't don't eat that. But what does the Bible say? We got to that and we ended our study with the verse over there. Where what where do we go to? Over there in uh let's see if I have that. It's either Timothy or Titus. Let me see. That everything, every creature of God is good, the Bible says. Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. So let's just find that real quickly. Anybody got that? I didn't have that in my notes here. Is it First Timothy or Second Timothy? No, it's not First Timothy. Ah, uh, here it is. Here it is. First Timothy four. Go to First Timothy four. 
This is where I ended it. <clears throat> First Timothy 4 in verse number one. So you would see this stuff starting to happen as it was in the beginning. So it's going to be in the end. And that's kind of what we did in part one with this <clears throat> teaching on the word abomination. <clears throat> but you have in First Timothy 4, verse number one, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. And if you take a look, I've, I've argued with people this fact, and they say, well, we're not in the latter times. Hey, if we're not in the latter times, what's going to happen in the latter times that isn't happening already? That's my point. Have some departed from the faith? Absolutely. Check that off. Have they given heed to seducing spirits? They're all over the world. They're seducing people to do all kinds of things and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Now, again, and I said this last week, I used to think that that was just celibacy and the teaching of cel celibacy and not eating meat on Friday and other holy days and stuff like that. But the more I look at this, it's not just that. And see, we were talking about this after, or after the study last week. Everyone's got to understand the foreknowledge of God and the way that he wrote his book. God's foreknowledge sees things that are going to happen throughout all history. So God wrote down things like this for events that might have happened 200 years ago. But also, wasn't he looking forward to other events that were going to happen that we can say, okay, this deals with the doctrine of celibacy, forbidding to marry. Nowhere in the Bible is it forbidden to marry and especially among bishops and pastors. It's promoted that you should marry. God says the bishop must be the husband of one wife, okay? And God wants you to marry. So a priest that's in that, says he's in that office, who says, I can't marry, is in direct violation of the Bible. So therefore, when that came out, celibacy, People who knew their Bible pointed and said, hey, forbidding to marry, and we can't eat meat on Friday, commanding to abstain from meats. What happened? Red flags started going up, right? Because they knew their Bible, and they said, that's not biblical. But over the years, has more creeped into society that we can point to and say forbidding to marry? What's happening today? The marital act and ceremony of marriage and the just ordinance of marriage is being pushed aside by man because now everybody is saying, we don't need to marry, we'll just live together. And in a sense, they are forbidding to marry. And that's where God says, don't do that, marry. Okay, it's better to marry than to burn. You get that? To commit fornication outside you know any act outside of marriage like this fornication god says marry so when you're allowing this in society you're forbidding to marry and when you get vegetarians that are preaching and promoting don't eat meat and people are saying don't kill the beasts and don't the bible says here abstain from meats commanding to abstain from meats so we could apply that to today as well all right now which God hath created. So God created those things. But they're to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So what should you do before you eat? You should pray. And in some cases, it's good to read your Bible and read a verse of Scripture, a little chapter of Scripture, especially around like Thanksgiving and times like that. If you're going to sit down for that purpose, it's good to read some Scripture. That food is sanctified by the Word of God and by prayer. So we pray, Lord, thank you for this food, and you ask the Lord's blessing over the food. And after that, you dig in. And whatever's on that plate, 
you're allowed to eat. Didn't God say that? Okay, so be careful for those that are telling you, hey, don't eat this, don't eat that, watch it. God said, I created it all, and you can eat it all. And we could go a little further with that for people that say, well, you shouldn't eat pork, or you shouldn't eat uh, crawfish, or you shouldn't eat that catfish. You know, they're bottom dwellers. You shouldn't eat that. What did God say in the book of Acts? What did he do on purpose? Peter had a vision, and on it was everything. And you could be rest assured, one of the main things that might have been right in the center of that sheet was what? A pig. A pig. <laughs> a pig. Because in the Bible, swine's flesh is off limits in the Old Testament. In fact, there were people that were eating swine's flesh and God really came down on them in the Old Testament. So that swine was one of those things. Don't even go around that animal. It's so filthy and dirty. You'd never think about eating that. That's why Peter was aghast when he saw this. And the Lord said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's like, what? What? I can't have that. And I'm sure that it was a huge hog in the middle of that sheet. And Peter's like, there's no way I'm eating that pig. You know, and it probably might, it might even go on like that at him, you know. And then you had your lobsters and your crawdads and your, your uh, crabs and everything else and on there. And they're coming at him like this and say, eat me, eat me. No, no, I, I'm not allowed to do that. And how many times did that happen? It happened three times. God confirmed it. Peter was in denial. But it was that God was using that to show him, don't call anything common or unclean. So can we have... On vacation, you go to Ocean City or Myrtle Beach or Jersey or somewhere. Can you get all you can eat crab legs? You need to worry about it. Dip it in the butter and go to town. Pray over it. Can you eat that? Go down south, some of those catfish farms. Can you eat that big slab of catfish? Sure you can. Pray over it. Can you have that ham? Yes. Pray over it. Can a Jew do that? They absolutely can. They absolutely can. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Hey, praise God. Praise God. The Lord's even given us liberty in what we can eat. So next time somebody says to you, don't eat that chocolate bar. Or watch. Yeah, it's like. Exactly. God gave you. God gave you the right to eat it. Now, again, you've got to be careful on how much of it you eat because the things you eat can kill you. If you eat outside what you should. We all know the drill, don't we? Okay, so this idea is on abomination, on abomination. And those are the things, just in summary, that I talked about last week. So let's go ahead and get into this a little bit further. And that what I just said is going to segue into the food of the Hebrews, the food of the Hebrews. It's dealing with abominations. Let's go to Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 11. Now, remember where I'm going. I'm going under the law here. And with the Jews under the law, they were commanded that they were not allowed to eat certain things, that they would be an abomination. So in time, way back in time, before Christ came, the Hebrews were supposed to have an order and a, of the, the way they ate, a certain thing on their menu they could not eat and things they could eat. And those that they weren't allowed to eat were considered an abomination. It was something God despised if they put it in their mouth, okay? God made everything, but yet under the law, he does have a division. And he tells you what the division is. And it's in the physical characteristics of the animals. So if I have feet like this, am I good? If if I'm a beast and I got feet that look like this, am I okay to eat? Yes. Not, well, okay. I got one part, right? But there are two parts. Not just this. What's the other part? Got to chew the cud. Does a pig have these? If you look at a pig's foot and a cow's foot, looks the same. But what's the difference? The cow has many stomachs and the cow chews the cud. The pig does not chew the cud, therefore it's unclean. Does a rabbit chew the cud? Yes, but does a rabbit have? No, so therefore you can't eat the rabbit 
the hair is unclean. Okay. God said, these are the physical characteristics. When you see a beast like this, a goat, for instance, has that and a goat chews the cud. Therefore, you can eat the goat. Okay. Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11. And let's look in verse 11. Let's look in nine. These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters. Whatsoever hath fins and scales. Okay, fins and scales. Can you eat a shark? Who says yes? Who says no? I agree with the no's. Does a shark have a fin? That would everybody knows a shark has fins. <laughs> There's not a person that's not afraid of that fin sticking out of the water. I don't care who you are. Say, I don't care. I'll jump in with them. Eh, there's something about that fin coming out of the water. It just makes you go, ooh. But it does not have scales. doesn't have scales. A catfish does not have scales. A walleye, fins and scales. Crappy, fins and scales. Bass, fins and scales. Okay? Anything you take a spoon and do like this, you know, that's how you get those scales off. Clean them. Okay? Scales, fins, they can eat that but they can't eat a catfish. They can't eat a shark. Okay. Couldn't eat that. All right. So fins and scales in the waters, in the seas and in the rivers, them shall ye eat. And all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers and all that move in the waters and of any living thing, which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination unto you. So that would include lobsters, crabs, and all that are scavengers like that. You would not be allowed to eat in the Old Testament under the law. They shall be even an abomination unto you. You see? An abomination. Hate them. Detest that. Don't eat that. You shall not eat of their flesh, but you shall have their carcasses in abomination. Whatsoever hath no fins nor scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination unto you. So if we understand the word abomination, we would, we would know that they would were to hate that. No, I can't eat that. I detest that. Can't eat it. Okay? An abomination. Let's look in down, down there in verse 20. In verse 20. All fowls that creep going upon all four shall be an abomination unto you. All fowls that creep. Okay. So you can see there ravens and 15, 16 owls, hawks, the cuckoo, the owl, the swan, the pelican. Eagle, stork, heron, lapwing, bat. They weren't allowed to eat those things. Okay? So those were considered to be unclean. Let's look in verse uh, 21. Yet these may eat every flying, creeping thing that goeth upon all four, which have legs above their feet to leap with all upon the earth. So before we go to the next verse, if you saw a nice juicy grasshopper, could you eat that? Okay. It says, even these of them you may eat. The locust, ugly things, but they're obviously tasty and they could eat them. The locust after his kind and the bald locust, I wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> so, but bald locust after his kind and the beetle after his kind and the grasshopper after his kind. But all other flying, creeping things which have four feet, he shall uh, shall be an abomination unto you. And for these, ye shall not, ye shall be unclean. Whosoever toucheth the carcass of them shall be unclean until the even. Okay, so abomination and touching the carcass. So if there was a dead bat and you touched it under the law, you would be unclean till the even. So had an abomination. A lot of this deals with what. God didn't want them to get what? He didn't want them to get disease. That's why under the law, very rigid. Stay away from these things because a lot of them carries, carry diseases. Now, somebody may say, well, that given the case, then wouldn't it be good to eat that way? And I'd stay away. If I held the law, I'd stay away from a lot of the diseases. True, the law had some very healthy things. They say the Black Death, the plague of the Black Death back in the 1300s, a lot of the Jews didn't get sick. Does anybody know the reason why? 
In fact, they thought the Jews were into sorcery and witchcraft because they weren't getting sick. What were people doing that were, they were getting sick? They were bathing in standing water. So the Jews were always told under the law, don't bathe in standing water, bathe in running water. Because the running water wouldn't have the disease. The standing water, people were bathing and using the same water. And therefore the plague was in the water. And when they were bathing that way, even though they were trying to clean themselves, they were contacting the disease. And this is why everybody thought the Jews were in the sorcery or something because they weren't getting sick. No, they were following what God told them in the Old Testament and they didn't get sick. So when people say, yeah, the law was good, it is good. No doubt about it. The, the Bible says it's good. But yet God gives grace to those in the church age today were at liberty. <clears throat> so <clears throat> these kind of things, uh, whether whatever diet you have, but the one thing we want to remember is no matter what you do, don't try to push it on other people. That's where the problem lies. Because if you're under the law and you're doing all this and you're trying to push that on somebody who's not doing that, the Bible says, hey, they're under liberty. They're under liberty. Don't use your liberty as an occasion of stumbling. Don't, don't do that. If you do it, do it. But do it yourself. And I tell you, because I went to Bible school, I got to get around a lot of Christians. And I was in a huge church. And there were a lot of little sections of the church and a lot of little cliques. And some of them dealt with eating. And there was one that they were passing around papers saying, stay away from the bacon bandit. And on it, it had all kinds of things that you shouldn't eat, you shouldn't do. And they were into all that stuff. And it's fine. If you want to do that, do that. But don't push that on everybody else. Because remember, liberty. We have liberty. Christ has given us liberty. Okay, so the food of the Hebrews. Abomination. Any questions on food? Any questions on anything I just went over? Anything? Any comments? Okay. Now, abomination goes beyond just food. Abomination goes into the manner of sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. Let's go to, stay in Leviticus, look in chapter 18. Leviticus 18. Let's get 18 in chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 18, Leviticus chapter 20. Okay, Leviticus 18. And let's look over here in verse 20. Leviticus 18, verse 20. It says, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Okay, so you can see right there how clearly God is on his soul hating. It's detestable to him when a man lies with a man. Okay, and that's basically exactly what that's saying there in 22. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith, neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. Now, the argument from today's generation that says that homosexuality and man with man and woman with woman is okay is that they'll try to say the same thing about eating the food. Get where I'm coming from? They're going to say, well, we're at liberty under Christ. Therefore, under the law, these things don't have to be anymore. But remember this. In the New Testament, God tells you that that behavior is wrong. In the New Testament, God freed you up to eat what you wanted to eat. He did not free any man, woman, to lie with a man or a woman in a way that was an abomination in the Old Testament. So homosexuality, if you read Romans 1, you'll see right there that God is against it. Okay, so 
when you think about the abomination here, and this is what you're going to you're going to face. There are a lot of homosexuals that are trying to justify the behavior by the Bible. I went on a website last week. I was studying this out. It was called the Gay Christian, and when I went there and looked at this, this man tried to prove that all of Sodom, that the sin of Sodom was not homosexuality. Okay. That's exactly what he was aiming to try to disprove that God did not destroy Sodom and because of homosexuality. It was because of something else. But when you study the word Sodom and its origins and all that's involved there, there's no way around it. Absolutely no way around it. But they're trying to find a way because they're trying... They're trying to justify themselves in the sight of God instead of just reading what it says and believing what it says and stopping the behavior. This behavior, the Bible says, is an abomination. And what does the word mean? Strongly detestable, strong hatred towards the act, towards this. God hates it. And that's all I can say from the scriptures. You read it, you can see God hates it. Let's go to Leviticus 20. Leviticus chapter 20, and there's more proof than just what I said there. You've got the book of Judges, the Benjamites. There's proof there. Uh, the thread is all throughout the Bible. I said this last week. Homosexuality has been here from the beginning, practically, um, and it's, it's always been a problem with mankind. Uh, Leviticus chapter 20, Leviticus chapter 20, and look in verse 13. If a man also lie with mankind... As he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Their blood shall be upon them. Okay, now uh, I'm going to move on a little bit, and I'll get back to this. I'll get back to this uh, with one of the parts here, justification of bad behavior. I'll get into that a little bit too, but I want to keep on moving instead of getting stuck on one point. Okay, but there will be more on that coming. Uh, here's another one. We talked about this last week. What about bringing anything that's an idol into your house? Now, you might not worship it, but what about bringing it into your house? The Lord cautions you of these things too. Idolatry and bringing idols or anything like that into your house. So be careful in your house what you allow in. And I know coming from an Italian background, and those of you that have for Italian, maybe Lebanese, uh, Greek, some of the others, uh, especially I know being Italian, we had the sacred heart of Jesus. My grandmother had all of this stuff. My mother had statues of Mary. I mean, before we got saved, this is what we had. Who has seen those in their house before you were saved? Who had all, who dealt with that or didn't even think it to be wrong? Okay, we got how many how many people growing up had this grandmother's houses, stuff like that? Okay, you'd go over there and see this stuff. Now, it was in my house too. Before my dad became a preacher, we were very Catholic. My mother grew up Catholic. My dad grew up Catholic. This was all acceptable. You know, we had, again, we had the horns. We had the hand like this, you know, that stuck down. You know, that's to do them a look. You know, and you got all that. In fact, I had learned how to give them a look. You know, it's like, and I saw my grandfather the one day giving them a look to somebody. It's like, what are you doing? You know, he's over there giving the evil eye to somebody. He's doing this. I'm not going to do it because, but I'm like, you know, he did it. And I watched him do it. Like this stuff. You might ch chuckle about it, but it's like, what do you do with all of this? Let's say your parent dies and they were into all this. What should you do? Should you look and say, oh, I really love this crucifix. I loved it. My mother, she just, or my dad, they adored this. I don't have the heart to get rid of it. This statue of Mary, it brings back so many memories. Like I grew up with this statue. I can't break this statue. What should you do?
Read your Bible and understand from king to king to king to king. Everybody was afraid to do what? Break down the images. Break down the high places. What about the brazen serpent? What did they do with that thing? They started worshiping. Did it have power? Yeah, for the purpose. But then they weren't supposed to be worshiping it. But they started to worship it until one king, who was he? Not Josiah. What king took it and ground it to powder? It was Hezekiah. Hezekiah, he took it. They called it actually Nehushtan. Nehushtan. It was their little pet idol they were serving. So you got to be careful. When something looks really nice, watch bring it in into your house. What woman got in trouble because she took idols? Rachel. Rachel, a godly woman. But she was sitting on a whole trunk full of idols. And her father wanted those idols. And she said, I can't get up because the manner of women is upon me. And he let her alone. And underneath of her were all of those idols. They were wrestling over those idols. She should have known better. Okay, now the Bible says it's an abomination. Bringing idols and the stuff into your house. Turn to Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy 7, verse 25. So if you're, if you, you know, and I know when it comes to estate sales and stuff like that and getting rid of all of it, I watched and my mother begged my dad not to destroy her Mary statue after he got saved first. And she was still pretty Catholic and still, you know, just traditionally Italian there. And he's like, I can't deal with this. And he started, he didn't want to just go out and break it. It was, it was hers, but he started praying and he said, Lord, you got to get this thing out. It was in their bedroom. He said, you got to get this out of here. I, you know, I don't want this in my house, but again, she wasn't saved. And one day she started getting real funny. She had short, she got saved and shortly thereafter, she got real funny with that thing. She said, because one night she woke up in the middle of the night and she felt like it was staring at her. And she said, I'm getting really bad vibes from that thing. She said, Jim, I, I, I want you to get it out of here. And he was like more, you know, he couldn't wait. He took it out in the back and just busted it and got rid of it. Now you say, oh, how do you do that? That thing could have been worth money. So should you sell it to somebody else then and get the money from it? <laughs> yeah, I know how your wheels turn. <clears throat> okay, what's the Bible say? Deuteronomy 7. The graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them. Doesn't that cover a lot of bases? Okay. Nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shall thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. God will take the curse from it and put it where? On you. But that thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. I think those two verses right there answer a lot of questions that I've had over the years about what do I do with my grandmother's sacred little idol? <laughs> what do I do with this? The Bible tells you pretty clearly what to do. Okay, now, here's another abomination. This is actually an abomination. Not giving God your best. God can't stand it when you don't give him your best. Okay? He can't, it, he detests it. Not giving God your best. Deuteronomy 17. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. Verse number one. Thou shalt not sacrifice unto the Lord thy God any bullock or sheep wherein is blemish or an ill-favoredness, for that is an abomination unto the Lord thy God. 
So it's pretty easy to say old Betsy over there has got a blemish. I think she's got a cancer. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go ahead and give her to the priest to sacrifice. What's God say? I don't want that. I want your best. And when we think about this, you can apply that to us here. God wants our best. He wants the best of our time. God wants the best of our energy. God wants the best of everything we have. So when you think about it, where do you belong at 9.30 on Sunday? Where do you belong? Where do you belong whenever these doors are open? Belong here. You say, yeah, but I'm a busy person. Here we go. The best of your time. Give God your time. And I'll tell you what, he'll give you back. God is not selfish. It's the law of tithing, too. When you tithe and you give God 10%, which what he, what, what he says, and people try to argue that and say, well, that's an Old Testament thing, the tithe. God established that. It's a perfect thing. God says, give me the 10th. And he take it right off the top, give it to God, and God will take care of you. Malachi, read the book. Will you rob God? Those things, when we do it, it's an abomination to God when we do not give him our best. It's like taking that blemished cow and giving it to the priest because you no longer want it. I'll give it to God. No, God doesn't want that. We take the best that we have and we say, God, this is my best. I'm giving you my best. Did he not give us his best? Okay, the best we're supposed to give to God. Okay, an abomination. And it does use the word abomination in verse four. So I'll read down from two to four. If there be found among you within any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, man or woman, that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God in transgressing, his covenant and hath gone and served other gods and worshiped them either the sun or moon or any of the host of heaven which i have not commanded and it be told thee and thou hast heard of it and acquired diligently and behold it be true and a thing certain that such abomination is wrought in israel then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman which hath committed that wicked thing unto the gates even that man or that woman and the and the and shall stone, uh, stone them with stones till they die. So idolatry, not offering God your best. Here's another abomination. As I told you last week, my wife and I over there at the, um, we're coming from Baden into Rochester, right when you get on the bridge, stoplight, we stop. In front of us is a car. It's got pentagrams and other stuff on it and a bumper sticker which says, this car is protected by witchcraft. And I said to my wife, you seen that? And she goes, it's unbelievable. This vehicle is protected by witchcraft. What's God say of witchcraft? Does that fall underneath one of his detestable things? Absolutely. Deuteronomy 18. Stay here. Deuteronomy 18, look in verse 9. When thou art come into the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found. <clears throat> hey, hey, how you doing, brother? Hey, Amen. No, no, come on in. Uh, you're a little bit early. I'm almost done. No, no, no. How are you doing? Okay. So let's Deuteronomy 18. And we're there in verse number nine. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Okay, so it's very, it's very important. And when people point to the Old Testament and say, well, why did God rid those people out of the land the way he did? And why did God tell the Jews that they weren't allowed to intermarry with all the other nations? What was the reason? Come on, you know your Bible well enough. What's the reason that God didn't want them to intermarry with the people of the land? Because 
cultures and traditions and idolatry and things like that. God, the people had gotten so bad that were in the land that the land, the Bible says, was vomiting them out. God did not want them in that land anymore because of their wicked, idolatrous traditions. They were burning their children in the fire. They were doing all kinds of unthinkable things. And God said, I'm going to move you in there. And when you do, I'm going to rid, I want you to rid the people out of the land and do not marry them. Do not take their sons for your daughters and do not take their daughters to your sons because God didn't want their pagan traditions and customs to rub off on the Jews and in any way pull their eyes and their heart away from God. That's the whole premise of the promised land. When you read that in your Bible, you see that immediately. Now, and God told them, when you go into the land, be careful what you dabble into. Because these things are an abomination. And again, we're focusing in Sunday school on the word abomination. This is now part two of the teaching on abomination and just that word. It means detestable and hated things and any object of extreme hatred. So it says in verse 10. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. You see, passing through the fire. They were, they were burning their kids up. They were taking their newborns and they were offering them to the gods that they were serving and letting them be burned up with fire in the worship. God detested that. Okay. Or that useth divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch wouldn't that take into psychics and everything else and what are you seeing in the world today i mean the other night i was just watching a sporting event and right there commercial come on psychics of california or something like that and it showed all these pleasant pictures and in the sun and all these people are just enjoying life and they're getting and it was very misleading to the idea of psychics can help you it didn't have anything about the dark side of this stuff. All was bright and good. The Lord says that stuff is an abomination. Look, divination, observer of times, enchanters, or a witch. So as I said, the bumper sticker on the car, this car, this vehicle is protected by witchcraft. Is it? If I was in the car, get me out of the car. Get me out of the car or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, look exactly what it says. What I said, the Lord, thy God, that drive them out from before thee, thou shalt be perfect with the Lord, thy God for these nations, which thou shalt possess hearkened unto observers of times. And unto diviners, but as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. Okay, now I had told you, I didn't get to it, but I had told you, and this is a great place to stop. I was going to get into cross dressing as well in the scripture. And uh, I have a couple statements from some of the old expositors on their feelings on the particular verse I'm going to go to. Um, it's an abomination to God. And a lot of times you just think that might be a woman that walks around maybe with uh, pants on or something like that, or a man that might wear a kilt or something along those lines. And you say, well, no, it gets deeper than that. Okay. It gets deeper than society today knows what a woman should wear and what a man should wear. But when you cross, you cross that line, something happens and God says, that's an abomination. And we're seeing that all over the world today. So I'm going to close part two with that little nugget to keep you, your appetite going for next week. Okay. So we'll do a part three on the word abomination. So last week, if you want to get part one, go to the website. It should be out there. Part two was today. Part three, I'll get into that a little bit more. I might have enough for a part four if you're enjoying this. Again, I don't want to, I don't want to belabor a point and you get bored and everybody falls asleep on me, but if you're enjoying this, we'll keep it going. Okay.